Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 1st, 2017, and I want to encourage all listeners to fill out your end-of-year survey where you can vote on your favorite episodes of 2017, please go to econtalk.org and you'll find a link in the upper left-hand corner. My guest today is Bill James, the man who brought serious data analysis to baseball and whose work revolutionized how we see the sport. His perspective has since spread to other sports. He has reduced ignorance and spread light. And in my case, helped me teach my children about how the world works using baseball, which they love to help them understand the challenges of thinking about uncertainty and probability. He's the author of numerous books on baseball and outside of baseball, including crime. His website is BillJamesOnline.com. Bill, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me on. Uh, our topic for today will be baseball, but we're going to cover a lot of other stuff uh, because you have a lot to say about other stuff. So I want to start with a, a general point you made in a recent essay. You quote, uh, you said the following, Daniel Patrick Moynihan liked to say that everybody is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. This has become a trope, and we hear it every day now. I think it's kind of a silly thing to say, actually. End of quote. Why? What's silly about that statement? Isn't everybody entitled to their own opinion but not facts? The, um, th- that statement by Moynihan has become a cudgel that people use to try to beat up anyone who disagrees with them about what the underlying facts are. Uh, in, the, in the tax debate, each side will do – uh, the, an analysis of what the effects of this will be, and these are just facts. And if you do disagree with their conclusion based on their facts, then you're ignoring the facts. Uh, the reality is that there are a number of situations in which the facts are absolutely clear-cut and the conclusion you would draw from them is clear-cut is pretty limited. And the generalization that everybody should share the same facts is of limited use. Well, you make the point uh, that there are there are a lot of facts. Uh, as one listener, uh, Econ Talk once uh, wrote me, and I'll put his name in the transcript. I'm forgetting it offhand, but he said uh, there are a lot of dots in the universe. You can connect them up to make a sh- any shape you want, but the question is, why would you leave out some of the other ones? And I think exactly. that's that's the big challenge in any kind of use of data. Exactly. That that's stated better than I could. <laughs> um, you recently made suggestions for speeding up baseball. Uh, baseball's got a big uh, problem, I believe. I'm a huge fan. Uh, but as I get older and I see uh, what young people are interested in and what keeps their attention, baseball appears to be a game that's designed for um, not being popular in the 21st century, other than the fact that you can, I guess, text and surf the net on your phone in between innings and in between pitches. But baseball is very concerned about this, and they're, they're trying to speed up the game, and they haven't been very successful, and most of the suggestions have not been very successful. You recently wrote an essay on this, and you suggested some very, uh, a very different approach. Uh, why, what, was your, what were some of your ideas, and uh, why do you think that approach is better than the sort of standard ones of timing people with a clock and penalizing them, that kind of thing? The, uh, uh, the problem is that we've been trying to – attack a, uh, a we're, we're trying to keep the lawn in order not by mowing the lawn but by pulling up the biggest weeds uh, and that's never going to work because there's always going to be another weed we're trying to say we're going to control this particular abuse and it doesn't have any impact at all and never will have any impact at all because there's always going to be some other abuse what you have to control is not the uh, a specific problem, but the the general problem, which is people using time to their selfish benefit within the game, but not to the benefit of the game itself. Um, it's it's often in the hitter's interest to slow things down so that he's in control of the at bat, or in the pitcher's interest to slow things down so that he's in control of the at bat. Uh, but it's not in the interest of the game itself. You have to put an overall control on it of some kind, such as an economic incentive 
to a team to play their games in a in a uh, an alert manner. Uh, otherwise, you, you, then you're never going to solve the problem. And so, what do you suggest? Well, there are a lot of things you can suggest, and the Red Sox don't like some of them, so I better be careful. You're a but, consultant. Uh, you're a consultant to the Red Sox. Why you say that, right? That, that's right. The um, but you could put into the system uh, rewards to a team that played their games in a in a quick fashion. What, what you can do is you can say that a game which has which has this many half inning breaks and this many plate appearances should be played in this amount of time, right? And if the game is played in that amount of time, then the team receives uh, some sort of incentives for um, alert play. Whereas if a game is not played in that amount of time, then for every five minutes that you go over, there's a there's a disincentive. Uh, and there are a million things you could use as incentives. For example, you could use draft picks as incentives or you could use disbursements from the from the uh, MLB uh, television funds as incentives or you could use uh, roster rules as incentives or a lot of things you could use as incentives but you're going to have to if you really want to solve the problem uh, you, you're going to have to manage the incentives involved rather than managing the uh, details of it I, I think you mentioned even home field advantage was that one of your ideas that's right. You could you could have a, a system in which if a team just doesn't pay attention to the clock and plays plays slowly, that they could give up a a, a home one or two home series a year, which would be of course a tremendous dis- disincentive to slow play. Couldn't it just be simpler? Couldn't it be? Um, uh, and I'm sure people have proposed this. A pitcher takes more than 25 seconds. It's a, a ball is called automatically. A, a batter that takes more than so many seconds a strike is incurred. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is it won't work because uh, if you if you punish one delay of game, another one will appear. Uh, there there are many many different ways that a, that a a uh, player can waste time within a baseball game throwing to fir- throwing to first base, yeah. uh, commercial breaks, the uh, uh, batter stepping out, pitchers taking too long. The fielders moving around on the field, defensive positioning. The uh, we have tried since at least 1960 to regulate the problem by regulating one of these or another. But if we can persist in trying to regulate specific behaviors, what's going to happen is we're going to get into fights about whose fault that was. Was it the was it the pitcher's fault that he took too long between pitches, or was it the batter's fault that he didn't get ready until the last in, instant? I mean, I'm not saying that that approach could not make any, any progress. For example, if you could convince the umpires not to call time when the batter asked for time, you would make progress. It's actually a in a certain sense, a really simple problem, and it's 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 simple. It's obvious what the solutions are: stop calling time. Uh, but we don't have the uh, we don't have the determination to do those kind of brutal things, uh, like order the umpires to stop not to call time. So the problem will persist until we until we change the incentives. And it's a beautiful example of public policy generally that. You fix one thing here or you monitor one thing here and the, you cause an unintended consequence somewhere else that doesn't um, – that actually will often make things worse. And it, it reminds me that uh, if I'm – I think you were an economics major in college. Is that correct? I was, I was, yes. So one of the great themes of economics, some of the themes of economics that I think about all the time are – we just mentioned one, incentives. There's uh, the seen and the unseen their trade-offs, opportunity costs, and your work to a large extent are applications of those ideas. You were you wanted to measure whether stolen bases were good for a team. Uh, you didn't just look at the stolen base. You looked at the fact that sometimes people were caught stealing, the unseen. Uh, you noticed that people walked, and uh, that was boring to most people, and they didn't – their statistics of the day didn't account for it. They just used batting average, not on base percentage – and as a result, we learned that getting on base was extremely important no matter how you did it. Uh, did the study of economics affect you in any conscious way? You're clearly a, 
you think like an economist, which is one of the reasons I've always found your work so interesting. But I'm curious if it ever consciously um, affected you. Uh, it, tremendously. I mean, yeah, yes, absolutely consciously affected me. In fact, all that I've done in, throughout most of my professional life is – is apply the principles of economics as best I understood them to baseball related questions. Uh, one definition of economics is economics is science of value. Uh, the, uh, and uh, uh, we, what I have done is try to figure out the value of everything on a baseball field. What is the value of a stolen base? What's the cost of a cot stealing? What's the value of a walk? What's the value of a, what's the cost of a walk to a pitcher? What a, Essentially, what I brought into baseball, brought, I brought directly from the study of economics, and I, I would never have done the things that I did had I not studied economics. There's no question about that. I just want to mention that you and Bill Belichick, who was also an economics major, are my two favorite economists who don't do formal economics. Um, and having grown up in Boston, I've been the beneficiary of both of your ex- expertises and understanding. Um, and I just used the word expertise. You recently wrote about the difference between science and expertise, which I thought was really interesting. And I think we're in a very uh, a watershed moment in how we look at science and expertise. So what's the difference between the two in your mind? Um, expertise establishes validity by the credentials of the person who speaks about it. The, uh, I, and I, w- I think I was writing about handwriting analysis. But you were. In, in handwriting analysis in a crime – uh, is not it has few characteristics consistent with it being a science science uh, in science something is known to be true by methods that are shared and known to lots of people and other people can follow the same steps and determine that this is in fact true whereas in something like handwriting analysis which is based not on science but on expertise the only way that we know that this is true is uh, that an expert tells us that it is true. The, uh, and this is problematic, very problematic in, in uh, uh, areas that rely on – we all have to rely on expertise, right? I mean, all I, get the time. Descri- I get described as an expert, you do, and you know, there's, we do tend to know things that others don't. But the problem with expertise is that experts tend to agree on a certain number of things that aren't true, that every field – gets to be infected by accepted principles of, uh, of knowledge that do not stand the test of time so that the scientists in one generation know that, that, the, that the scientists of the previous generation were wrong about hundreds of things. Science is a method of rooting those things out and discovering and replacing them with more solid uh, analysis, whereas expertise passes those things along from generation to generation. Well, a reporter once asked me uh, some questions about international trade, and then suddenly in the middle of the interview, she had a moment of unease, and she said, you are an expert, aren't you? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, uh, I didn't really, I was thinking about it. I was thinking, I'm not sure how to answer that. And then I I said, thinking I'd reassure her, uh, well, I wrote a book on international trade, and she immediately said, oh, okay, fine, thanks. Oh, that's great. Because for her, that meant I was uttering truth. And I think, um, you know, in areas that are that are highly controversial, climate change, uh, economic policy of various kinds, uh, whether there should be a designated hitter in both leagues, the, you know, the key central questions of life, uh, people do tend to look to uh, experts – and just be re- they want to be reassured that oh okay because they know that every we all know we can't figure everything out for ourselves we we need some help uh, and that credentialing thing I, you know I find it deeply disturbing in economics actually uh, you know the people you know the ver- one version of this is people say well you know Hayek who I happen to respect greatly and have learned a lot from Hayek was in favor of Social Security and as if I'm therefore supposed to now be in favor of Social Security myself because Hayek was. And I always say, well, he's not a prophet. He didn't get the his words from Mount Sinai. Um, yeah, I'm allowed to disagree with him. <laughs> it's, right. it's crazy. And, and in in a true science, you, you, I think true scientists understand that if you if a a junior high or or an undergraduate physicist is able to prove that Albert Einstein is wrong about something, then 
He's supposed to be taken seriously despite his lack of credentials. Of course, it's difficult for that to happen, but it's supposed to happen. And it can and does. Um, and of course, as you say, even, you know, we did a, I did an interview with uh, Chuck Klosterman on, uh, but what if we're wrong? Because there are thousands of things, as you point out, that we're wrong about right now. We just don't know what they are. It would be great if we could, we just need an expert to tell us which are the wrong things and which exactly. are the right ones. Exactly. Uh, now you're writing about a ransom note for John Benet Ramsey in that in that story. And what was your conclusion? A, a lot of people had speculated that that ransom note had been written by her mother. Uh, what was your uh, thoughts on the uh, evidence? It could not be more obvious that it was not written by her mother. And the, the ex, no expert will go into court and swear that it is was written by her mother. But many experts will opine not in court that it was written by the mother. The uh, uh, and and the, the problem is that the construction of the letters is identical between Patsy's handwriting and the ransom note. The way that they construct letters is is the same, but the individual execution of that construction is just totally different. So the question that is whether you focus on the construction of the letters or the execution of the letter of uh, the letters uh, and and the way the letters are executed is different with every letter. I mean the way she makes her A's is different the way she makes her B's or C's or D's the 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 construction is always the same but the execution is always different. And is this an example which is true in economics constantly of people who want to believe something so they convince themselves that it must be true and only note it and cherry pick the things that are similar. Right. They, you construct a narrative and then you fill in facts that fit your narrative. Yeah. We all, we all do that, of course. Yeah. Uh, how did you get interested in crime? It, is it a natural outgrowth? Cause is it a, is it a search for truth? Is it the elusiveness of, of truth and how challenging it is? I think so. Uh, crime stories are by their nature puzzles because crime, um, one old definition of murder is a murder is a killing done in secret. Uh, since it's done in secret, it is it creates a puzzle and puzzles bother me. I've been interested in crime stories since I was less than 10 years old. As soon as I started reading the newspaper, newspapers are full of them. And uh, the way that I tried to figure out the world as a young person was through the newspapers. Now, you've changed how a lot of people thought about baseball. Not everybody. There, there's still some holdouts. Um, and because of Michael Lewis and the book Moneyball, which was an application of your, your thoughts and, and insights and analysis, you changed how people think about a lot of things, not just baseball, but uh, people talk about taking a Moneyball approach, where, which by which they mean – some hidden advantage that's being missed, some opportunity that the data might illuminate. What's your, um, are there areas of, of sports and maybe a baseball where you think that's been taken too far? And are there areas you think are ripe for application that have not been done yet? Well, I wouldn't say that it's taken too far. We do have a lot of problems in our area. And one of those is that people discover an advantage and want to rush toward the exploitation of that advantage, often without stopping to consider whether the negatives of doing that might outweigh the positives. Uh, a few years ago, the relevant example was uh, defensive shifts. Uh, once we had good charts, uh, scientific charts, of where batters hit the ball, uh, people immediately wanted to start moving the fielders to where the balls were hit without stopping to prove huh. that that uh, this was actually going to save more hits. And I, and I was got on the wrong side of that debate because I kept saying, let's hold on, let's hold on, let's, let's make sure we're, what we're doing is right. But it did, it turned out that the there were more benefits than cost to shifting in a lot of cases. Thus, you know, I was on the wrong side of the issue. But we're in a similar debate now about how soon you go to the bullpen. What is called bullpenning, which means playing the entire game with your with pitchers pitching just a couple of innings at a time. I mean, there is an advantage in that, in that a, a relief pitcher pitching just a couple of innings has the same advantage 
that a sprinter does as opposed to a marathoner. You can pitch more effectively in a short burst than you can in a, in a more sustained effort. And there's no question about that. The, the thing is that can you apply that without limit, without causing yourself other problems that are greater than your benefits? Well, it slows down the game a lot. That yes, the use of the bullpen, right? Because that it can, it, yeah, it can and has recently. I, I think right. um, that's that's another thing that's going to if you know if we if you regulate the how rapidly the pitcher changes, then you, you know, that's another thing that consumes the time that you saved. Yeah, they'll they'll figure that one out easily. Um, that reminds me of a question that's bothered me for a long time. I don't know if you've ever written on it, which is I've often noticed that after a successful. It just seems to my intuition that this is more of a problem in baseball than other sports. After a successful season, uh, World Series run, for example, that the pitchers the year after struggle to be as effective and could be just luck, right? They won the World Series because they they happen to have a good thing of luck, and then it's reversion of the mean. But it's also possible to me that, and I assume this is true, that in situations of high import, Crucial at bats, crucial innings, crucial games. Pitchers reach back for a little bit extra and and damage themselves to some extent. You think there's any truth to that? They try harder uh, with the, with certain batters, with certain innings, with certain games. They try harder. It, there could be some some truth to that, but um, pitching is a perilous activity by its nature, and the more of it you do, the more likely you are to encounter some sort of negative event for your arm and take a step backward. So uh, it has not been established that I am aware of that there is a special risk associated with a postseason play, although a lot of people believe that there is, but I don't think it's clearly established. I guess one way to think about it is whether the uh, whether fastball gets faster in those crucial situations. I'm not thinking of, quote, trying harder, which I think is a bizarro concept for professionals that somehow, you know, I love this when they say they never quit. Well, they're, it's kind of their job to do their job. I don't even think right. it's bizarre that people would say that. But 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 rearing back for a little bit extra has always um, seemed to me to be a real thing. But I don't know. Right. I think it is a real thing, but it's also, particularly in baseball, a dangerous thing. But also you see that in basketball in, in in uh, basketball, with the game on the line with two minutes to play and your score tied, one of the things the coach is going to tell the players is, "Don't, don't try to be a hero here. Yep. Uh, the uh, don't try to do something that's not within your skill set. Uh, just because the game is on the line, that that won't work. Instead, you have to have some. The coach has to have something in his back pocket that he's worked on and planned for to pull out at that moment. Yeah. Uh- we didn't get to the – and if you didn't want to answer it or, or um, you just forgot, but are there areas of sports that you think are ripe for uh, the sabermetric approach, the sabermetric approach being the phrase that, that you coined to describe the application of data and facts to the questions of sports, of baseball? There are so many of them that, that it's it's beyond anyone's understanding. That, that My belief is that the things that we don't know outnumber the things that we do know not by – 10% or 20%, but by ratio of billions to one. Consequently, when you remove a little bit of ignorance from the world, uh, it doesn't have any impact on the amount that remains because, you know, it's the, the ratio because of the ratio. Just last night, I was watching a football game and uh, there was a play in which a the quarterback, Kirk Cousins, threw a flat pass that was tipped at the line of scrimmage and then inter- intercepted. So I went on Twitter and asked my Twitter followers, uh, what's the data on this? Does throwing, is throwing a flat pass, because it may be tipped at the line, is throwing a flat pass more likely to be intercepted than a pass that has some loft to it? And the answer I got was, nobody knows. Nobody knows it's, never, yeah. it's never been studied. There are millions of things like that that just, you know, it seem obvious. It's an obvious question. You'd think somebody would know the answer, but nobody does. Do you follow other sports as, with anything close to the intensity that at least that you at least used to follow baseball and how much you follow baseball now? I assume still quite an intense amount. Yeah, yeah I, I'm a huge college basketball fan. The uh, I live in Lawrence, Kansas, and uh, the hope of the Jayhawks. I go to every uh, Jayhawk home game. I ha- I, the Jayhawks play in Allen Fieldhouse, which is a historic 
Fieldhouse. I've seen more than half the games ever played in Allen Fieldhouse. The uh, it's uh, I've been oh. going to games there games there for a long time, and and uh, it's a big part of my life. Well, I think you're five years older than I am. I'm 63. Uh, according to my father, uh, when when I was three years old and we lived in Ames, Iowa, my dad was going to uh, Iowa State for grad school. Uh, we we saw Iowa State play. Uh, play Kansas, uh, which would have been Will Chamberlain's uh, right. That's right. time. So I guess that was an away game. You probably weren't there, but I like to think we were we were kind of close there. Um, is there anything that you've changed your mind about and uh, why? Important. Is there anything important you've changed your mind about? Is there anything that that you mocked in your mind, at least the traditionalists for the, the older approach to baseball that you had to later concede to yourself or to the public that – yeah, you know, they were right about that. Well, uh, I'm wrong about so many things that it's hard hard to pick one. I mean, every every book is, in essence, a review of what we wrote last year and say, where were we right and where were we wrong and how can we improve on what we did? But a better answer to your question, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole area uh, called chemistry and character. Yeah. That uh, and the the problem with it, and I used to, I'm sure, write derogatorily about people who referred to these things. I would still write write mockingly about anyone who pretend, pretended to understand these things. But what I uh, understand as an old person that I didn't understand as a young person is that we, is that these the problem with these concepts is not that they're false, but that they are too broad. Uh, the problem with the, the concept of team chemistry is not that it's a real thing, but that it's it's so ubiquitous that it, encover, it encompasses uh, hundreds of different things. And in order to understand it, we have in front of us a long, long a path that we have to walk of breaking down that that huge concept, team chemistry or individual character, into components and under, gaining an understanding of each of those components before we will have any, before we should be discussing the overarching concepts, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I just don't, I'm skeptical about our ability to measure those in any useful way, right? I, I think, again, as a Red Sox fan, John Farrell and Terry Francona, I think, ran a good clubhouse. That's the impression I got, whatever that means. As you said, I don't know exactly what that means. Then there came a time when they weren't. When Francona right. wasn't running a good clubhouse, um, evidently the players ate chicken. I was, and suddenly things went off the rails uh, during between innings or something. Uh, but but it clearly it matters. But I can't imagine we'll ever have much of it, much insight into it. But do you disagree? Uh, no. Ten years ago, I would have agreed with you, but now I, I think we can gain a. I think we can improve our understanding of those areas. I think you know we might be a hundred years away from truly having a a clear understanding of them, but but I think that we could improve those uh, our, our understanding, and I, th- I think we could. I think I have an idea now, which I didn't ten years ago, about how you could approach those problems. And you're going to keep that to yourself, I assume. No, I've written about it. Oh, okay. Uh, but I mean, I'm too old. I'm I'm too old to benefit from it anyway, right? We're not going to figure this stuff out until I've been dead for a long time. Uh, so you know, there's no no benefit to me. It's like. Well, I thought you'd share it with the Red Sox and not let anyone else have it. That's what I was thinking. Uh, nah. the, uh, it's it's, it, it's too, too big a subject. To, the Red Sox aren't going to figure it out either. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Terry Francona knows something, right? It's not – anybody who thinks Terry Francona doesn't know anything that we don't know in our field about managing the a clubhouse – for, to keep the right team chemistry. Anybody who thinks he doesn't know anything is wrong. He does. Uh, but but uh, commit, creating a systematic equivalent of that is a big task. So one of the things I emphasize on this program is humility uh, with respect to knowledge, especially statistical data-based questions that appear to be solved by some approach. And you seem pretty good at that, too. At least uh, that's my reading of your understanding. You, you're happy writing, I was wrong about this, uh, unlike many professional economists who that phrase has never been uttered by them in their, in yeah. their lives. Uh, 
Is there anything you thought you were pretty sure about, maybe even totally sure about, that you had to go back on and realize, what was I thinking? Well, one thing that we definitely took too hard a stance on in the 1980s, uh, I say we, but I should say myself, um, is clutch hitting. Uh, That's what I was thinking about, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was early early analysis in sabermetrics which suggested that um, there was probably no such thing as a clutch hitter. And I bought into that analysis and endorsed it and seconded it. And it's so fun because it's so contrarian right. to the the right. perceived wisdom. Right. What we know for certain now is that the concept of clutch hitting was enormously overstated by previous generations. Uh, There's no, no, every, anyone who studies it knows that that's, that it's not what it was once believed to be. But uh, the conclusion that it doesn't exist at all and that no one has an ability to step forward in a key situation was reached too early by bad methods and we should have known better. Yeah, it's, um, it's the same issue of the hot hand in, in basketball. It's the same right. uh, challenge. Right. Very difficult. It's actually a surprisingly difficult question, to I think, to analyze carefully. I'm, I, a lot of people uh, criticize me for being uh, too skeptical about data, and yet I'm very um, passionate about the application data to baseball, and I feel that way because it's a pretty closed system. The relationship between performance and outcomes – it's not perfect, of course. There's uncertainty. There's all kinds of random elements that enter in. But it's, I think of it as a closed system as opposed to, say, the economy, where people are trying to measure, say, the effect of stimulus spending. Do you agree with that? Do you think that's true? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That, that, I mean, that's, that is why baseball fascinates us, I think, is that it, it's a, a miniature universe which is small enough – that uh, that we one can figure out what is happening within that miniature universe. I mean, all of the things that we argue about in baseball have parallels in real life, but in baseball, the universe is small enough and and closed enough that we have a chance to figure it out. Whereas in real real life, is so messy and so complicated that we have little chance to figure it out. I mean, what we were just talking about, team chemistry, right? It's not like a baseball issue. It's it's an issue that affects every business yeah. and every uh, and the economy and the society in general. But in the society in general, it's so complicated that, you know, we're not talking about 100 years to figure it out, but thousands. In baseball, the universe is small enough. It's a closed universe, so you've got a chance to figure out what's happening there. And even in that small universe, of course, Well, there's one other important point, which is that baseball has a lot of individual activity, so individual interactions. So we're – I'm pretty sure Tom Brady is a really good quarterback, but I'm not so sure that if he had to play for the Cleveland Browns from day one that he'd be anybody. I'm pretty sure Bill Belichick's a good coach, but there's a lot of randomness uh, in sports outcomes. You know, people complain – my my fellow Patriots fans complain. We could have won seven Super Bowls. Yeah, we could have lost all five that we won too. They were close. All of them were close games, where little small things here and there could could make a difference. Whereas in baseball, it's true that if you're lucky, you might get to bat a little more often against mediocre or bad pitchers in the course of a year. But it's 162 games. It's really hard to argue that Jose Altuve is not a good baseball play, offensive baseball player. That's right. just it's. It, but you could argue that. A lot of other things in the, in the real world aren't as – they're just not as – a lot of the a lot of the other variables aren't present. And I think that's the that's the closed open aspect of it that's that's relevant. Right. And the, by the way, to speak to the small issue, we wondered for years whether uh, it was true that some players might have good years because the team just doesn't face a lot of good pitchers. Um, and, by random if, luck of the rotational – way it plays right. out right and, and but when you, we finally reach a consensus then no that's not true that's that's not a, it's not a big variable and whether teams have good years or not but, you know you, you might explain a two game variation but even, even a, a two game the, the standard deviation of luck caused by who you face uh, in in terms of starting pitchers is probably less than a game a year 
You went from being a crazy guy in the basement who had this self-published thing called the Bill James, the Baseball Abstract, I think it was called originally, which I loved. Uh, in 1977, it was like it was just a, an exhilarating thing when I when I found it and when I got it every year. And now you're a consultant to the Red Sox. You've been involved, I think, for some time in arbitration cases. What most surprised you in that move from outsider to insider about what baseball was actually like once you got on the insider that you can share at least? The uh, the most surprising thing was an understanding of how many people contribute to a championship. Uh, and and it, it, it literally is impossible to explain to an outsider – how many people it requires doing how many different jobs at a high level in order for a baseball team to win a world championship. The, and the number of streams, the number of little streams that feed into that river is, uh, it's almost incalculable. You have to, if you pick it on, on, on a single player, let's say Dustin Pedroia, you have to look at everybody who had a big influence on Dustin and Pedroia, which may include your minor league uh, managers or your minor league coaches, and it may include uh, the scout, the, the first scout who focused on him and the other scouts who focused on him. Uh, but it also includes you know, his father and his, his high school coaches, and, and all of those people had some impact on the Red Sox eventually winning world championships in 2007 and 2013. So I can appreciate that. Why did you – why did that come to your mind from that – you could have understood that in 1977, that, that for Dustin Pedroia to have a good year in 2007, he had to have had all kinds of things happen. What what made that, that insight so vivid to you? Just seeing it – what makes it vivid is seeing it in action. When you work around the team, you you see these people come and go. And and you run into a lot of people who are trying to claim their little acre of credit or their little inch of credit, and and they're all right, they're all correct, and, and they all deserve it. The, uh, uh, the uh, so you, you just, I don't think I could have understood it in seventy seven because it runs counter to the other point we were just making, which is we were talking about it being a closed universe, uh, and it is a, it does appear to be a closed universe in a sense it is, but it also draws upon a much larger and more open uh, community. So when I watch football players after a game from each side, uh, there's they swarm the middle of the field and they, they're always, usually they're smiling as they face these people who've been trying to rip their head off for the last uh, two, three hours. And it, it's always struck me that those of us outside football have no understanding whatsoever of what it's like to be a football player. Uh, we think we do because we say, oh, wow, he got knocked down. That must have hurt. But, you know, they hurt for days after a game. Now we're starting to get some appreciation of it because of the worries about concussions. And But I think there's a camaraderie among football players about what they experience literally as warriors that we on the outside don't know. Is there anything like that in baseball that you observed that that that, that is, uh, you know, I'll give you an example you know, fans will cry after a loss. Uh, some players will too, of course, and some go out and have a good time. Are there things like that in the in terms of the psychology of a of a player who has to play 162 games that that have that you noticed? The um, well, I'm not all that close to the, the, what happens on the field, I'm, so my ability to observe that is limited. Uh, there is a a world there that we can't enter. I mean the no matter what you, an awful lot of people approach a major league player and and try to buy his respect for by their understanding of what he's going through, uh, and it's it's a futile task because you cannot enter their world unless you're one of them, and it's it's never going to happen, right? The uh, uh, the I think that you get a little bit of a sense of that. If you have like a child who does karate or taekwondo or something, they, they, they you get a little bit of sense of that, that these two young people will try to knock each other flat and, and they actually are enjoying doing it. Uh, it, it and, and they create a little 
universe in, in, in themselves, but there's a shared experience that is meaningful to them and you can't share it. I remember uh, it's probably a 1979 baseball abstract where you uh, talked about Butch Hobson and you said he played baseball like a football player. And as a result, his elbow had about 900 chips floating in it, bone chips, and he couldn't throw. And so he was not just a below average fielder. He was the worst fielder of maybe the 20th century. And, and you wonder whether a lot of players are like that. And you want to say, don't crash into the wall. It's not worth it. I just wonder if those that kind of advice is is um, not receivable by the by the recipient. Yeah, well, I think, but I, I don't know, but I know that I have said in meetings with scouts in which the scouts would talk about a player having a football mentality. And uh, and, it, and it's the same observation that I had about Butch Hobson. The scouts will sometimes say, uh, "This guy's got a this guy's got a football player's mi- mindset. He you know he wants to he wants to um, dominate every play." But in baseball, there are too many plays. You know, you can't you can't win by trying to dominate every every play. You just wipe yourself out. You've got to you've got to look at the long the big picture. Uh, and, and so it, it is an observation that other people make as well. Uh, recently, uh, Joe Morgan suggested that steroid users um, should never be allowed in the Hall of Fame. They don't belong in the club. I don't know if you've written about that. I apologize if I haven't seen it. But uh, have you written about it? What are your thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. And uh, and have you thought about whether steroids actually made a difference or not? We've had Art Devaney on this program who suggests that uh, – Barry Bonds and Sosa McGuire were just extraordinary home run hitters, and we were uh, fooled by the fact that they had big muscles into thinking that's why they hit home runs. Well, he'd have he'd have some distance to go to con- convince me about that one. I mean, I, I don't have any question in my own mind that the steroids did have a huge impact. Where I think that, look, I, I'll, I'll end this up by talking about respect for the other others side's opinion on this. But this is the way I see this. Um, rules have to be enforced in order to be rules. If they're not enforced, the essential nature of there being rules is lost. There has to be a written policy and a, uh, a specific set of guidelines that say, if you do this, we will find you, and this is how we will find you, and this is what will happen. Baseball in the steroid era didn't have any of those things. Uh, So players could use steroids without any consequence. And a player has massive incentives to succeed. So, of course, players did use steroids to help them succeed because there were massive incentives to do so. And in reality, there was no rule against it. People come along after the fact and say, that was outside the rules. And it's very much like the illegal immigration debate. Yeah. If, you, if you don't enforce that rule at the time that you are supposed to enforce it, which is at the place where you're for, supposed to enforce it, it becomes very hard to say after the fact that we – that uh, this they're a cheater. person – They're a cheater because, the, the, because we didn't enforce the rules. I, I don't think that's – I don't think you can do that. I, I don't feel that any – action against McGuire or Bonds or Clemens or any of those other people accused of using steroids is if it was in the period when the, there were no rules and no rules were being enforced, I don't feel that there's a justification for that. That's my opinion. On the other hand, I do know that that Mr. Morgan and others merely want for the game to be it is better if we do if we play the game without those things right it's better if we can play baseball without using substances that may harm us um and without using artificial things that uh that create statistical illusions uh it's better if we can do that and i know that these people merely wanted to keep the game healthy wanted to keep it pure and and, uh, and and did not want anyone um, t- make getting un- getting an unfair advantage, and it's a legitimate perspective on the issue. But I I do disagree with it. 
Yeah, we're not doing this over video, but when you said that thing about rules that aren't enforced uh, aren't rules, I I spread my arms and looked to the heavens. So I uh, I can't document that, but I longtime listeners will know that we make a big distinction on here on the program between uh, law and legislation. Legislation are the things that are decreed by the by government policy and in, in statutes, but law is what is actually what people follow. And there are a lot of laws that aren't legislation, and there's a lot of legislation that aren't laws. And what you're saying is that there was no norm. There was no norm to – it's it's like the um, – there's so many rules in baseball that aren't written down. There's so many rules in prisons that aren't written down. We had an episode with David Scarbeck on that, which I recommend to listeners because it's so fascinating. Uh, but it's an enormously important uh, point, which uh, you said very well. Thank you. Um uh, is there any – we're talking a little bit about the Hall of Fame there implicitly. Are there any um, – and you wrote a very thoughtful book on the Hall of Fame. Are there, do you have a personal player that you feel strongly about is is not – who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? Are there any that you have an emotional attachment to? Like for me, it's Jim Edmonds. I think Jim Edmonds was, one of the, was an extraordinary player, but he's, I don't think he's going to make it. It's not going to make it. This year, he's, not, or he's going to make it in the next 10 years eventually. He was an extraordinary player, and eventually there may be more recognition to that. The, um, the guy I would focus on is Minnie Minoso. And it's, that was a long time ago, and, and uh, Minnie played the 50s. Minnie uh, was not – he was a player uh, of you – know, he was Cuban, but he's quite dark. And he was discriminated against – First, in a in an absolute manner, you can't play because you're black. And, but later, in a lesser level, so that he didn't get to play in the majors until he was halfway through his career. Then he had an extraordinary career anyway. And I, I feel that many should be in the Hall of Fame, but he's not anywhere near going in. Do you believe the date on on uh, catchers being able to frame pitches and have? Do you think umpires have responded to those claims in any way? And Finally, do you think we're going to go to a world where umpires aren't out there, but but electronics are for accuracy of strike balls and strikes? Uh, it's kind of a Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat uh, problem that that uh, that once you expose that that this this uh, is being done, and you de- demonstrate that it is being done, that it can't be done anymore. Uh, because people know that you're trying to do that. Uh, I do think we have reached, I think I think a corner has been turned, whereas five years ago, some catchers were really good at framing, at framing pitches. Now it is dangerous for a catcher to, to grab a pitch and draw it back into the strike zone because the umpire will see that movement and, uh, and will, decide that the ball was outside the strike zone or he would be trying to <laughs> trying to drag it back in the uh, uh, yeah. so uh, I, I believe in it but not too much you know you think they're makeup calls at sports like that also where you get one wrong you realize oh he, he deceived me i'm going to get him later uh umpires say that they're able to not to learn not to do that and i suspect that, <laughs> i suspect they probably are it's sort of it, and again, that's, that relates to your earlier question about how do you see things different after you're a professional but when you're an amateur. Uh, when you're an amateur, you tend to think that uh, nobody will get to that level at which your emotion doesn't cloud your judgment. But you do. You do reach that level when you're making decisions about baseball players that you 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 stop being a fan enough to know that uh, – a uh, player on a different team really is better than you. You know, I'm not going to say who's better than Dustin Pedroia because that might cause problems. But you do reach the point at which you realize that there there are players on other teams that are better than your players, and you you learn to judge them uh, without that deep deep fans bias. Uh, the uh, and I suspect that umpires do learn not to, to do learn to discard that bias. However, uh, there is there is a study that could be true. I'm not going to say studies show because I don't believe in that phrase. It's a, my least favorite phrase, probably in the <laughs> in the discussion of these kind of things. But there is an interesting study that suggests that basketball referees favor the home team, and of course, it would be 
it could be a conscious. I'm not suggesting that there's a decree, but if it's good for the game that home teams tend to do better, not infinitely, not always win, but do better, I could see that in sports you would favor the home team to make sure you get the good. You find that that leads you to get the better assignments. Um, I, I just think it's interesting how, at least as from a fan's perspective, how little careful analysis there is of the accuracy of, of refereeing and, and calls. Of course, in football, it's become a big issue with replay and now a little bit in baseball with replay. And But I think it, it would be interesting to go back and look at some of the old calls and see if there was systematic bias there. I suspect I suspect there is. Maybe there isn't. Hey. Um, yeah, it could well be. The, uh, uh, but that touches on an issue that, that is a bugaboo for me, which is journalists will not talk about umpires deciding the game or referees deciding the game. In college basketball, yeah. particularly in the tournament, there are an astonishing number of games which are decided in the tournament by calls by umpires that aren't necessarily right. And I don't believe that it's right not to write about those things. The, the, um, uh, of course, the players are banned by the leagues from commenting on their officiating, which I think is wrong. I don't think they should be banned, and I don't think legally they could be banned if somebody would fight it. Uh, and the, uh, but also the journalists cooperate in that, and they think we don't want to make the umpiring the story here, so we'll write about the players, and they skip over the umpiring. But it's not right, and it allows substandard umpiring to flourish because nobody calls it out. Um, uh, so so I, I feel strongly about that issue, that, that's, that journalism is on the wrong side of that subject. Well, it's interesting to me about coaches, but co- I think coaches do this for different reason than pursuit of truth. They'll say – Oh, that call didn't cost us the game. You know, there were 40 other plays and we could have averted that being a decisive play. And I think they do that on purpose. To for, They would certainly have an interest in doing that to keep their team from focusing on uh, whining as a strategy. And of course, many coaches do whine incessantly as a way. In soccer, it's a lot of control. I, I think it's really unfortunate. And it's true in basketball, too, the, the tendency to you know, to try to draw a foul, a foul call by doing something that's that's dishonest, deceptive is a better word. It's not dishonest. Um, what do you think of that? Um, for a couple of years, I coached one of my son's little league baseball teams, and uh, they were just, these were just eight and nine year old kids. But that actually is one of the keys to having a good year: is you've got to get the kids not to focus on the umpiring. I mean, uh, uh, what? eight, nine-year-old kids will do is they'll, a couple of call will go against them. They'll start complaining about the umpiring and, and you've got to tell them, you know, guys, we are not blaming the umpires for this. This is on you. It's not on them. Uh, and, and, uh, of course, professionals have been told that since they were eight years old. So they, they have a different perspective on it. But, uh, I do think that, that an, um, uh, a coach has a legitimate reason that he has to, he has to keep his players focused on what they're doing rather than what the umpires do. For sure. Did those eight and nine-year-olds know who their coach was? <laughs> no, they didn't have a clue. Because, uh, you know, I, if I'd been the, the dad of one of those kids, I would have said, you guys, we're going we're gonna to mop up this league. We've got, the, we've got the greatest baseball thinker of all time but, in our dugout. Uh, you, 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 ought, you, ought to, you ought to try that. Uh, there, were, there were people who – I don't know how many of the parents would argue with me about you know, this, that, and the other <laughs> – it's like, uh, and you can't say this, of course, but you, you're thinking, do you guys have any idea who you're arguing with? Right. The, uh, I'm uh, an the, expert. Uh, I am an the, actual expert. I, that's right. That's right. <laughs> now, having been a Little League coach myself, which is a one of the great character building um, exercises of all time, I, I'm very sympathetic. But it reminds me of another thing I wanted to ask you as a consumer of sports commentary – uh, which has improved immensely over the last 50 year, 40 years because of you uh, and others like you. There's been a huge in- improvement in, in the uh, thoughtfulness and in, in analytical nature of, of sports writing, but there's still quite a bit that's not very analytical, not very thoughtful. And one of the ways that manifests itself in my – there's a lot of ways, but one of them is that a manager will make a decision or a coach, and it doesn't turn out well, and, and the fans go nuts. And they can't understand why so-and-so pinch hit for that guy or didn't pinch hit for that guy. Why Pete Carroll called that passing play was so obvious a run was better. And I just 
I'm struck as an outsider, and I would love to hear your perspective, of how ignorant we are of what goes into those kind of decisions. It goes back to the chemistry point, the, you know, the care with which a, a manager will be will take not to uh, discourage a player, that they're looking ahead to other situations. I just, uh, I just have the feeling that many of the things that are called stupid are not. Right. The, and you know, within an organization, I will tell you that, that it does become tremendously important that you not second guess your manager on an hour to hour basis, because once you start permitting that to happen, then everybody in the front office is, 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 is uh, second guessing the manager 10 times every game. And it does interfere with the operation of your, your franchise. So you, you can't, you just can't allow that to happen. The, uh, but I assume, but uh, there's an area in which, as a professional, I haven't entirely been able to outgrow it. When it gets to non, I mean, I, I, I can stay on the page when it comes to the Red Sox. I don't second guess Red Sox managers, even in my own mind. But when it's not the Red Sox, then I do. Uh, an example is Dave Roberts uh, going to the bullpen. In my view, ridiculously early and for no damn good reason, for no good reason in the in the uh, 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 World Series. Roberts went to the bullpen early and ran out of pitching. And I just, uh, I was like any other fan. I thought, why in the world did he do that? Does it make you try to think of why it might be true? Why it might have been a good decision? You ever come up well, with Well, <laughs> it started to debate, in this case, it started to debate on that issue, so. Well, you know, uh, Dave Roberts is one of those people who, one of the millions of people who made uh, that Red Sox championship possible. With one right. single play, ironically, a stolen base, right? That right. you and I are very skeptical about um, in general. I, I, for me, it's the Joe Madden use of the bullpen the year before, um, keeping Chapman in for as long as he did. I just it was driving me crazy. I, I, I was, despite my having two Cardinals fans in my in my family, uh, having making the mistake of living in St. Louis, uh, and they don't like the Cubs. I was rooting for the Cubs. And I just, he was killing me, but they, they managed to somehow win that game. <laughs> right. The, uh, 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 despite some, some decisions that didn't work out in the end, it did. Yeah. And then everybody, if it works out in the end, then everybody forgets the interim decision. And he's still a genius. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah. Good. Now, yeah, you, but are you saying it's a mistake to live in St. Louis? But, uh, uh, well, it was obviously was, because if I, if I hadn't, my kids wouldn't have been Cardinal fans. We've had a lot of pain in my family because I've, I have two children who were very, very intense uh, Cardinal uh, and St. Louis general Rams fans now, um, L.A. Rams fans. But, you know, unfortunately, the Red Sox and the Cardinals, the Patriots and the Rams went head to head more than once, which is um, it's tough. It's tough. I've got yeah. to pretend I don't care. It's, it's Well, if you, if, if you want company, John Henry, the owner of the Red Sox, grew up as a Cardinals fan and was a passionate Cardinals fan. And he told me that in 2004, when the Cardinals were playing the Red Sox in the World Series, it was actually it was hard for him to root for the Red Sox, although he obviously he did. But but it, that, that tug to, to see those Cardinals come through was still there. Wow, that's fascinating. Now, you're you were at least uh, a lifelong at some point in your life, a Royals fan. Uh, are you still a Royals fan and just just being associated with the Red Sox make is that hard for you? Well, being a Royals fan was hard no matter if you no matter where you were. Uh the uh the a few Red Sox, years. Yeah, the Red Sox offered me a job in 2002 and this was after 10 years uh in which the Royals had lost something like a thousand games. It wasn't a thousand but it <laughs> seemed like it. it felt like the, it. Uh, yeah, and it was really really tough being a Royals fan. Anyway, once the I had a reason not to be a Royals fan, it was really, really easy to give that up. Um, the uh, so I I still I mean I I watch the Royals and I root for them because my my mother in law does and she's a sweet lady and uh, you know you like to see her have a good day and you like sure. to see your other friends have a good day, but I don't care that much honestly. Wow, well, that's that's interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought that. I, if it, so, if it was Red Sox against Royals, you'd root for the in the. To get into the World Series, you root for the Red Sox, if, if or do you Red care Sox, about anybody? I might, maybe you don't if, have any teams you care about. No, no. If the Red Sox fired me tomorrow, I'd still root for the Red Sox the rest of my life. Oh. It's just it's it's uh, I'm I'm committed. Okay. Back in February 2016, you wrote a really uh, provocative essay on uh, self righteousness and uh, that we've become 
one, uh, a nation of whiners, which we alluded to earlier, and two, we don't stand up for ourselves, and uh, three, we're co- overconfident about a bunch of stuff. Um, what was your argument? What what, what, what do you mean by uh, – and, of course, we've seen it play out by – on college campuses now a lot, on, on speech. What was your argument about self-righteousness? The, uh, the self-righteousness is the great problem that afflicts our political culture. Uh, and the, the problem is that uh, large numbers of people on both ends of the political spectrum are so convinced that, uh, that they are correct and that failings to see their correctness are moral failings that uh, we ha- are, have lost much of our ability to communicate from one end to the spectrum to the other. And there's no justification for it on either end. None of us understand the world. The world is vastly more complicated than the human mind. No one understands whether these policies are going to have the intended effects or whether the unintended effects are going to be greater than the intended effects. No one knows the answers to those questions. And the people who are convinced that they know the answers to those questions are just wrong. Uh, And uh, it's become a huge concern because people are so angry based on their self-righteousness that we are... The anger repeatedly expressed, anger building on anger, building on anger, eventually leads to violence. And we need to get people to back away from the conviction that they're right and see that they may be wrong, not about something, but about everything. My guest today has been Bill James. Bill, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much for having me on. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.